get started. Good afternoon and welcome to the Science Library of University of Oslo. Today is Geo Wednesday, a special lunchtime where we reveal the natural wonders of our planet. My name is Carmen Gaina. I'm a professor of marine geophysics in University of Oslo. And it's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Valentina Manni. Valentina received master and PhD degrees from uh, universities in Italy, like University of Rome Sapienza, University Romatre, and Bologna. She also worked with University of Durham in UK before joining our Center for Earth Evolution and Dynamics, a Norwegian center for excellence hosted by the Department of Geoscience at University of Oslo. So it's my great pleasure to introduce Valentina and I warn you that she's a magician. She can tell the dark secrets of the deep earth by just looking at volcanoes. Okay, thanks Carmen for the introduction and thanks to uh, whoever is following at home, I have no idea if there's anyone following, but I hope there is someone. And welcome to the science library with kind of no audience, but uh, you can see the campus a little bit, so maybe it brings you here. Um, okay, so when we look at, when we think about the interior of the earth, uh, we have this kind of uh, schematic cartoon in mind where we have different layers and we have the rigid uh, outer shell uh, of the Earth, which is the lithosphere, which is composed of the crust and the lithospheric mantle below. And these outer shell forms the tectonic plates um, that we see at the surface. And then below that, we have uh, the mantle, the upper mantle, the lower mantle, and then the core. And that's great. It's a great cartoon to have in mind, but things are a little more complicated than that. Uh, because the mantle is actually convecting. So things are moving inside the earth. There is material that is cold and wants to go down and material that is warm and is, uh, is going up. <clears throat> um, and so what you see here in, uh, in this uh, section, it's a seismic tomography model, which is uh, telling us how fast the seismic waves are moving uh, inside the earth and how they're moving inside the earth and these different colors are showing if they're moving uh, faster if they're traveling faster or slower compared to kind of um, this kind of static layered uh, model and that's great because it can tell us what happens inside the earth and so we I think we should more think of the inside of the earth as more like this kind of cartoon where we have um, lithospheric plates that are uh, subducting into the mantle. So they are sinking into the mantle as they are cold. And so in a process that is called subduction. And so we have uh, regions in the, uh, in the earth mantle that have this downwelling flow and uh, regions uh, in other places where there is upwelling. Uh, and today in this talk, I will talk about uh, subduction. So I will focus on this process. Uh, so this is a map that shows the subduction zones that are active today. Uh, and you can see, for example, that there's a lot of them around the Pacific. And the colors here are showing the depth of the plate in the mantle. So the depth of the slab is called. Uh, and you can already see that these uh, slabs, they have different shapes. Some of them uh, are more um, steep than others, and some of them uh, have reached a higher depth than others, for example. Uh, but so in, this is the story of the many ways that subduction is shaping our planet. So this is how uh, subduction is really changing the planets in many different ways. And so before I start, I just want to make sure that everyone is on board on what subduction is. Uh, so we have a lithospheric, um, a rigid 
layer, which is the lithosphere, that is, as I said, uh, subducting into the mantle below another plate. So here you have two plates uh, that are meeting here at the trench, and one is sinking into the mantle. And the reason why it's sinking is because it's cold, and it's colder compared to the uh, mantle that is surrounding it. And if it's colder, it means that it's denser, and therefore it's kind of pulling down, and it's, it hap it's happy to sink into the mantle. So we have this force, which is called the slab pull, that is really pulling the plate towards the interior of the earth. And uh, the first effect that this thing has is um, mantle convection. So because we have uh, plates that are moving down, we create this downward flow into the mantle, and this creates uh, these kind of big convection cells into the mantle. And so we have, as I said before, region of downwellings and regions of upwelling. And these, as, a, as maybe you can, I hope you can see my pointer, maybe it's a little small, but maybe you can see it. You can uh, see these uh, big convection cells in the mantle. And what you see here is that what they do, these convection cells, is that they also drive the plates, the movement of the plates. So one, another thing that subduction does is driving mantle convection and moving uh, the tectonic plates at the surface. So what you see in this map here is the different tectonic plates on Earth now. And the red regions are regions where you have uh, subduction going on. And you can see that some plates are moving much faster than others. And that's because they are surrounded by subduction zones. Okay, so another thing that uh, subduction is uh, doing and another way subduction is shaping our planet is building mountains. And as you can see here in this sketch, what happens is that sometimes um, an ocean is closing and two continents collide. And when that happens, then you create these orogenic belts uh, that you see all over around the world, and you have continental collision. And so you have, like, for example, the Himalayas. It's this cartoon is showing the example of the Himalayas. Uh, and the reason why that happens is that the lithospheric um, plate, the, the oceanic lithosphere, it's happy to sink into the mantle because it's, it's dense, but the continental lithosphere has a different composition, and the continental crust uh, is actually lighter compared to the, to the ocean, oceanic crust, and therefore it doesn't want to subduct. It, it resists subduction. And so what happens is that when, you, uh, when the continents arrive at the trench, then you have at depth the oceanic slab that is still pulling uh, with the slab full force and is still pulling down, but the continent at the surface is actually trying to resist that force. And these uh, opposing forces are creating high stresses in the slab and they usually tend to break the slab. And so you end up with the oceanic lithosphere that is lost into the mantle and the continental lithosphere that is still more or less at the surface. And that's why we preserve continental uh, crust and we don't really preserve much uh, con uh, oceanic lithosphere. Uh, but what happens after you break the slab is also interesting because what you see in this model is if you see these stars, they are showing how uh, the crust, the continental crust is uh, subducting at depth and so it reaches depth of maybe 100 kilometers or so. And then after the slab has broken off, you don't have any more this slab pool at depth and you have the light material that wants to come up again. And it does so, and sometimes we see that at the surface. So what happens is that you bring this material, these rocks are going to high pressure because they go deep and high temperatures, and then they go back at the surface. And so, Apart from building mountains, what subduction does is also making beautiful rocks, like this eclogite that I saw last year in Western Norway. And this, is, this rock has formed ex exactly in that way. It went at depth, it transformed because the minerals changed their structure, and then it, it came back up. 
and we can see it now exposed uh, at the surface. And another thing that subduction does is making beautiful landscape because I think these are beautiful places. Uh, and admittedly with the help of weathering processes, but that's, um, uh, but still we have mountains because we have uh, subduction going on. Now another thing is um, arc volcanoes. So another way that subduction is shaping our planet is uh, creating volcanoes. And so what you see here is the map that you saw before showing all the slabs that are uh, in the mantle today. And here below you see the uh, position, the location of uh, arc volcanoes, uh, the recent arc volcanoes and which are still active today. And you, of course, you see that they correspond exactly to where subduction zones are. Uh, and actually the picture that I uh, show you and I use for the title slide and for the flyer of this Geonsdag, it's uh, a picture that I took uh, in Japan, uh, which is a very active, uh, volcanically active uh, place because of subduction. Uh, okay, so how does it work? How do we form uh, a volcanic arc? So we start with our plate, which by now you you recognize what these cartoons means. So you start with a plate that is subducting, uh, but one ingredient that we really need, uh, it's water. So what happens is that um, the oceanic lithosphere that is subducting into the mantle is hydrated and it has minerals that are called hydrous minerals that can contain water in their structure. And uh, these uh, plates, because they have to bend at the trench to be able to go to the, into the mantle, as they bend, they fracture as well, which is what you see in this seismic section here. You see that there are different uh, structures and, uh, um, th sorry, different folds. And because of these folds, the water can actually percolate uh, deep inside the uh, oceanic lithosphere. And therefore, this plate that is sinking into the mantle is hydrated. But what, once water gets to a certain depth, it means that it's, the pressure is higher and the temperature is higher. And some of this water is released from the slab. And depending on different parameters, like the age of the slab, the velocity of the sinking velocity, then you have different trajectories that you see in this diagram showing the temperature and the pressure. Uh, and so you can release more or less water depending on these different parameters. But the idea is that there's always some water that is uh, at this depth, maybe around 100, 200 kilometers is released and is released above the slab. And above the slab, there is the mantle. And so what happens when you bring water into the mantle is at high temperatures is you allow it to melt because you, when water uh, is present, the melting temperature of mantle material is uh, getting lower. So now you created uh, some melt here above the slab. And this melt is, uh, it's lighter than the surrounding material and therefore it wants to rise up and it does so and it gets into the overriding plate. And once it gets into the overriding plate, it's re-equilibrate with the, uh, with the plate. So some minerals are crystallizing uh, and creating intrusive volcanic rocks, but some part of this melt keeps uh, going up and it keeps its journey uh, up and that uh, sometimes creates volcanic eruptions. And the vol volcanism that is in subduction zones is uh, the most explosive one. Uh, this picture is very different from, for example, what you can think of how Hawaii looks like. Um, and as you keep doing that, you kind of make the, you create new rocks during the years, the millions of years, and that makes the volcanic arc grow. And this is how you create uh, a an arc volcano. And by looking at these, uh, try to actually find pictures for this talk, I remember a story that I, um, 
I came, uh, I saw in uh, in Japan, and I just uh, take a few minutes to to tell you this story because I like it. So this picture is showing uh, a lava dome uh, called Showa Shinzan uh, that is in the island of Hokkaido in Japan. It's next to a volcano, an arc volcano, which is called Mount Uzo. And this lava dome, uh, it formed between the end of 1943 and September 1945. Um, so in, before there was nothing and then it became this lava dome that we see today. But actually the story that I want uh, to tell is about this person here that you see in this statue. His name is Masao Mimatsu and he was a, a postmaster in the village uh, where this volcano formed. And he, when he started to see that this was forming, he started to, to draw, I think, almost every day what was happening. And so he kind of have created this really detailed study of how a lava dome uh, can form in the 40s. And so here you can see his drawings just some of his drawings. And you see that you start with a, a field where there is nothing at all. And then during the years and through different eruptions, you create this uh, lava dome that you see today. And here you see some pictures of kind of the before and after the lava dome has formed. You can probably spot the peak uh, that is in the background. And you can see that in the before picture, there's, basic, there's nothing in the field here. And afterwards, you have this, uh, this lava dome. And it took like one and a half year, I guess, to make this. But I think the great thing is that uh, Mimatsu, he created these diagrams, uh, really detailed diagrams. He really measured the height of this dome and uh, how uh, large it was and how it grew. And he, he made this, um, this uh, diagram where you can see it's so detailed that you can actually um, calculate the rates of growth of this dome. And he, this diagram is called after him because he presented his work in the World Volcano Conference, which I just found out yesterday that it was held in Oslo. Uh, and so he presented his work and the volcanologists were very happy about it. And I actually, when I went to this museum, they, they, you, you can see pictures of him with famous volcanologists uh, that we can actually recognize and we see, still see it, uh, well, we saw in the past uh, at conferences. But um, I think it's, a, it's great because it's kind of showing that everyone can contribute to science. Uh, okay, so another way of uh, another way that subduction is shaping our uh, planet is through earthquakes. Uh, I guess this is kind of a famous thing to know, but subduction is are the places where earthquake, the big earthquake happen, and that's because you have these two plates that are um, uh, so there you have one plate that moves. Uh, and wants to sink into the mantle, but then it, it kind of uh, finds the friction uh, with another plate. And what happens is that you kind of lock this interface between the two plates. And when you uh, accumulate too much stress, then the, an earthquake happens, and then you unlock for a little while this region. And it's a kind of a cycle. So to make the plate move and go deep into the mantle, you need, these, you need the earthquake to unlock the, the subduction interface. And here you see a model that shows exactly that. So that when you see the, a lot of uh, yellow arrows, that's the moment where you have an earthquake and, and then you accumulate stress and then another earthquake happens. And this model, I, I like it because it really shows something that scientists uh, saw in the Tohoku earthquake. Uh, in 2011, which was, of course, a very large earthquake. And uh, with the GPS data, what you can do, uh, Japan has a big network of GPS station, and what they were able to do is to, to see the movement of the plate before the earthquake and during the earthquakes and after the earthquake as well. And so this uh, plot here is showing how the plate is moving in, um, 
before the earthquake, so during kind of an average uh, secular, it's called uh, interseismic uh, velocity. And you can see there is uh, maybe a couple of centimeters per year, but you can imagine that if you want to uh, move something by two centimeters per year, you're kind of accumulating stress. And then when the Tohoku earthquake happened, this is showing the displacement at the moment of the earthquake, the horizontal displacement. And you can see that, the, so the yellow arrows, these scale is two meters. And so you can really see how much, a lot of energy is released and a lot of the plate is really moving during the earthquake uh, towards the trench, whereas uh, between earthquakes is moving away from the trench, which is what the model was showing before. Uh, so the Tohoku earthquake happened at a depth that I think it was 30 kilometers, so it's still quite shallow. But we have, in subduction zones, we have uh, earthquakes that are also very deep, and they get as deep as uh, 600 and so kilometers. And uh, what these earthquakes can, um, can tell us is actually they can help to uh, show the shape of the slab at depth. So what you see here, I realize that I use the Japanese area a lot, but I guess they have the most data. And uh, what you see here is different uh, sections of um, the, the slab and the subduction zone here in the, this is the Mariana subduction zone, uh, Izubonin Mariana subduction zone. And what you see uh, in these sections is how deep this earthquake can get. Uh, so when you put together the location of the earthquakes with the uh, tomography models, which if you remember at the beginning, they're showing uh, kind of fast places where there is fast, um, the seismic waves are moving fast and places where the seismic waves are moving slower. And so what you see here is that the, you can really nicely see the blue part, which represent the slab, so represent the plates, the, the lithosphere that has been uh, subducted. And it fits very well with the location of the earthquake, even the deep ones. And when you took very different sections of the same slab, um, you, first of all, you see that the, they, even here in the same subduction zones, they can have very different shapes. So for example, you see that here in the north, the slab is, uh, is uh, flattening around 600 kilometers, and that's where there is a limit between upper and lower mantle. Uh, whereas here, more in the south, this is not really happening. And especially towards the last section, you can see that the slab is kind of penetrating through the, the lower mantle. And so you can put these together and you can try to image a 3D, let's say, version of a slab. And this is very useful because it can tell you something about the dynamic of subduction. And you can, under, you can try to understand what happened um, in the past as well. Uh, okay, so how does the slab really interact with the mantle? So, so far we kind of talk about shallow things, but when the slab is going into the mantle, it, uh, there are many forces that are at play here. So first of all, the mantle is kind of resisting uh, the, slab, the, the slab going down. So there, is, there are some sort of shear uh, forces here. Um, and the lower mantle is more viscous than the upper mantle. So when the slab reaches this uh, upper lower mantle transition zone, it, it kind of encounters higher forces that are resisting its uh, sinking, its journey down into the, into the mantle. And so you see, for example, in this cartoon here that these arrows are um, thicker than in the upper mantle because that's what they are showing that the lower mantle being more viscous is kind of resisting and it's uh, against the slab going down. But another thing, other, another thing that happens is, oops, it's a uh, phase transitions. And so the, as the slab goes down, the minerals uh, that are in the, man in the slab, they actually change their structure. Again, as I uh, explained to you before for the dehydration of the slab. But in this case, what this transition does is that it makes the material 
a, a little bit more dense uh, in the in this transition zone at the 410, the slab because it's cold, it starts to uh, transform a bit earlier. So there is kind of a transition that makes easier for the slab to sink. Whereas the opposite happens when you get between at the transition zone between uh, upper and lower mantle, you have a phase transition that it goes the opposite way and it actually uh, it kind of goes against uh, slab sinking. So all these different forces are playing a role in the way the slab are, uh, the shapes of the slabs at depth. And so this uh, figure here is showing uh, the different shapes that uh, the slabs that are, the subduction zones that are active today, apart from this one, the Farallon slab in North America, which is uh, an old subduction. Uh, we can see the shapes of these labs, and you can see that they're very different. You can see that you have, for example, here on the top left, you have many slabs that flatten at this 660 discontinuity, so between upper and lower mantle, uh, whereas you see that others are just penetrating through. Uh, and you can see that others are kind of bending and buckling at the transition zone, and then maybe they keep sinking. Uh, and the interaction between the slab and the transition zone, it's still uh, uh, very much debated why we have all these different behaviors. And for example, there are some slabs that are flattening not at the 660, but deeper than that. Uh, but one thing that we um, recent studies have noticed is that it is possible that uh, younger slabs are, for younger slabs is easier uh, to penetrate into the lower mantle. So when the lithosphere is just younger, uh, then it makes the slab, um, I think, yeah, it makes the slab a bit weaker and uh, it just stays at the, it doesn't want to flatten and unbend a lot and it kind of buckles and it reaches, it penetrates through the transition zone. But the, this is not true for all the cases, so the jury is still out for that. And, uh, but another thing that um, recently people are starting to understand is that even though you, are, you see slabs that are flattening now at the 660, uh, so between upper and lower mantle, it doesn't mean that they will stay there forever. It's just a kind of a transition phase. And this lab will sink at some point into the lower mantle, but the timing for it to do that is very different for different subduction zones. Um, okay, so I'll go back to this cartoon because I kind of started by saying that uh, you have cold lithosphere that is dense and it's happy to subduct and therefore it's easy to, to have subduction. But the problem is uh, that to start subduction, it's actually quite difficult because to start a new subduction zone, you need, you have the lithosphere that is actually quite strong because it's cold uh, and therefore it's difficult for it to bend. So at the beginning, it's not that easy to create this shape. So once subduction is going, then great. Uh, it's kind of uh, goes on and it's uh, happy to do that and it's sinking into the mantle, but the beginning of it is still very uh, puzzling for a lot of scientists. Uh, so now the, the thing is how does a new subduction zone start? Because uh, this is something that we actually really don't know much, uh, don't really know yet because, well, first of all, because we cannot really observe it. Uh, we have regions nowadays that are possibly location of uh, new subduction zone events. So maybe subduction is starting, uh, for example, south of New Zealand. Um, but this lab hasn't really developed yet, so we, we cannot really see the whole process because it takes millions of years and we don't have that time to observe that. But what we can see is what we can look at old. Uh, well, subduction zones that have already uh, been created, and we can try to uh, find out from rock records, from tomography, from many things, we can try to find out how they started. And um, there, there have been many models 
that have been suggested for how many mechanisms that have been suggested uh, for how a new subduction zone starts. So what you see here in these diagrams are kind of uh, yeah, uh, schematic uh, cartoons of the different mechanism. So for example, if you have subduction that is already happening uh, and maybe for some reason at the trench you have a, a small continent, you have some um, buoyant feature, something that is less uh, that is lighter than the, the plate and it doesn't want to subduct, maybe you create some sort of um, changes in the forces, in the stresses on the plates that kind of makes either subduction jump somewhere else or flip polarity. So what was the overriding plate before becomes a subducting plate. Other models suggest that subduction can be what in the past was called more like spontaneous. Uh, meaning that maybe you have some sort of, um, um, so, yeah, you have, for example, in this case, you have a transform fault where you have young and old uh, oceanic lithosphere that is, they are next to each other, which means that you have this sort of kind of step in the lithospheric structure, and therefore you have maybe this old uh, plate that is, again, is denser compared to the young ones, Maybe it just wants to subduct and at some point it can start subducting. Or at a passive margin, it can happen the same thing, although I have to say that it hasn't been observed that much in the last 100 million years. Uh, but that's a mechanism that is suggested. And this last one, it's a, it's a bit of a different one. It's, you can maybe start subduction when you have a hot material that is rising up from the mantle. And so when you have this plume uh, that is hitting the bottom of the lithosphere, it makes the lithosphere weaker and maybe it makes it weak enough for it to start subducting. And there have been uh, many models that have tried to study this and I, there's no, I don't think there's a right answer to this. I think that uh, many mechanisms are possible. We, we know that Earth is behaving differently in different places, so it's, we don't have to find just one mechanism that everyone is happy with. Um, and, but one thing that we can look at is to understand how the different mechanisms happen. It's to look at the regional tectonics during the moment of the subduction initiation event. And this is what we did uh, already a bit more than a year ago with uh, colleagues uh, at SEED and uh, a lot of other early career scientists from uh, all over the world. Um, we kind of uh, came together to try to create this database, which is called the Subduction Zone Database, Initiation Database, and you can find it on this website. Not quite yet, because it's not published yet, but it's gonna be published very soon. Um, and what we did is to look at different, uh, at many different subduction zone initiation events for the last 100 million years, which you can see here in this map. And for each of these events, we look at geological evidence, we look at plate reconstruction models, we look at seismic uh, tomographies, we try to connect it to geodynamic models, so the numerical models or analog models that you saw before. And by putting all this information together, we kind of came up with the reconstruction of that event, um, of that subduction zone initiation event for the different uh, regions. And importantly, we kind of looked at, looked at what was happening around uh, the region at the same time. So we kind of compiled this big database, and these are this is kind of showing, I think, the kind of the highlight uh, of the study, which is that, for example, we looked if there was subduction happening nearby the, uh, the, where the event happened, if there were ridge, spreading ridges, transform faults, if there was uh, maybe a continental plate close by, an arc uh, already there, a, a volcanic arc that was already present, or uh, for example, if uh, if there was a collisional event that happened along the trench uh, of an already active subduction zone. Um, and we, we actually found that 
uh, a nearby subduction and a collisional event are actually very common for uh, these subduction zone initiation event, meaning that maybe you have these regions where you already have maybe some subduction close by, and if for some reason maybe it stops, then it kind of changes the forces that are in balance uh, on the plates, and maybe it changes the, just the direction of a plate and it creates stresses somewhere else, and maybe these stresses are enough to then start a new subduction zone. But that's, um, so this is a, a database that will be, will be available to the public. And the idea is that people can contribute to this database so that we make it better and better. Um, and, okay, so anyway, so the last thing, maybe I've been very fast, but the last thing that I want to say in the way subduction is uh, shaping our planet is that it made it possible for us to live in. Because um, yet the fact that we have plate tectonics, uh, it means that we keeps uh, plate tectonic uh, keeps volcanism active for a long time. And um, the fact that we have volcanoes help having this uh, well, volatile uh, cycle that where uh, volatiles are going inside the earth, but they are actually also, uh, we have emissions of greenhouse gases in the in volcanoes. And um, these are actually, uh, it's a good thing because if we didn't have the atmosphere that we had today, first of all, in terms of composition, for example, it's something that is an atmosphere that we can breathe. Uh, but also it's, uh, it makes the climate that we have today, uh, which it, what, mean, what it means is that if we didn't have this uh, greenhouse effect, uh, we would have like basically a freezing earth and we wouldn't have liquid water, for example. So uh, this is actually making possible for Earth to be a, an habitable planet. And with that, I am done. Uh, no, I'm not done. <laughs> Oh, okay. And then I was maybe supposed to tell at the beginning that you could ask questions on Facebook, but I didn't, so no one has asked any question. Uh, or maybe you just didn't have any question. Uh, but I think we just leave it like that. And bye. <laughs>